Uh, it is with great pleasure for me to introduce Ulrike Hahn, who is Professor of uh, Psychology at the University of Berwick, London, uh, where she also directs the Center for Cognition, Computation and Modeling. Um, Ulrike, I learned, first actually qualified as a lawyer in Bavaria <laughs> before she uh, took the journey to cognitive science and psychology, um, and she got her Doctor of Philosophy in Experimental Psychology in Oxford. Uh, she has won numerous awards, and for example, she is also, um, I'm being Swede, so I have to mention this, she also has an honorary doctorate at Lund University. Um, and Ulrike has a wide range of, of research interests spanning judgment and decision making, categorization, language, and especially uh, rationality. And uh, on a personal note, uh, uh, I think that Ulrike's work is really innovative and uh, always thought-provoking. And uh, close to my own uh, interest in judgment and decision-making is his research together with Adam Harris, showing that uh, patterns that look like biases uh, can actually, are not actually a bias, but is actually as a consequence of some uh, statistical artifacts. And with that, I say welcome and go for it, Ulrike. Thank you. Um, okay, so without further ado, um, I want to talk about belief polarization and why it's bad. So it's prompted by a talk I gave a year ago where somebody said, well, but why is polarization actually bad? And uh, the aim of the talk is basically to clarify why or help me clarify to myself why by considering the implications of belief polarization for decision-making collectives. So there's gonna be a particular setup here uh, in which this is framed. And in that setup, there's going to be a prospect with a true value, some, some thing, some outcome that, that will obtain. And it also has a true expected value. And I'm gonna assume in first instance that agents in the, in the group and the population know that true value of this thing uh, at issue, but they have uncertainty about the probability with which it will occur. So they also have uncertainty about the expected value. And then I'm gonna contrast different belief distributions that all have the same mean and hence the same expected value and examine uh, the consequences of these distributions for the, for the group. So, so that's, there, that's where this is going. So uh, I'm specifically going to look at three different belief distributions. Uh, so to make these numbers readable, uh, these are histograms uh, of these belief distributions in populations of 10,000 simulated agents. And uh, population, uh, probabilities are numbers between 0 and 10. So we don't have to deal with sort of decimal places. And there's a normal distribution, basically, a bimodal distribution, not the most extreme one you could imagine, but a pretty bimodal one, and a uniform distribution. And I'm going to compare uh, these different belief distributions uh, in their impact on the decision making of this collective. So I'm going to take these distributions of beliefs about the, the uncertain uh, event in, in question, and combine these with the true value, right, to calculate subjective expected values. And unsurprisingly, when I do that, those distributions of expected values take on the characteristics of these different distributions, right? So this is the true expected value of the prospect. This is what we get uh, with the normal distribution, the bimodal, and this uniform distribution. And now I'm going to show these in a different way. Uh, what I'm simply going to do is rank uh, the individuals in the population by their subjective expected value for this prospect from low to high. So these are our 0 to 10,000 individuals, and this is the subjective expected value that they assign to the prospect. The black line is the true expected value. And uh, what's shown here is the distribution of expected values across these ranked individuals that we get for the uniform distribution. And uh, the normal distribution looks like this, and this is what we get for uh, the bimodal distribution. If you plunk that all into one big picture, uh, it looks like this. Now, uh, this is useful, I hope, because these plots allow us to read off all kinds of relationships. So we can see immediately, for example, that in this green region are going to be 
the individuals in the population who think this prospect is worth more than it actually is, right? Their subjective values are higher than the true value. And these guys down here are the people who think it's worth less. And so we can now take, for example, a particular asking price for this prospect. And by just following these lines, we can see what population proportion assigns a subjective value to this prospect that's actually uh, below the asking price. And we can do this for different proportions and different asking prices and so on. So I wanna use that to now consider some examples of group decision-making. So let's assume in our first example uh, that this, this collective, this group has the opportunity to buy this prospect, this uncertain prospect at the true expected value. They of course don't know this is the true expected value, but that's the price I'm assuming. And I'm gonna assume also that they have to vote on this and they're going to require a five eighths majority for no particular reason than that it puts the line in a pretty place. So this is the proportion of the population that's on board with this because they think it's either worth more or it's a fair value. Uh, this is how many people they need to get to. And so there's a gap, right? There's an additional part of the population that they need to get on board in order to collectively purchase this thing or decide that they're going to purchase it. And so basically for this population proportion, which follows in that red zone, you're gonna need some extra provision. You're have to, gonna give them something, some sweetener, some added incentive for them to come on board and agree to buy this. I'm just gonna call that extra bit. You need the minimum additional outlay. And then we can look at this minimum additional outlay as a function of these different distributions. This is what we have to fork out for the uniform distribution. This is what we have to add for the normal distribution. And this is what we have to add as a minimum additional outlay to get people on board for the bimodal distribution. So we can see immediately that this minimum additional outlay, the additional costs of getting people on board to the point where they think this is advantageous for them to vote with you is going to be largest for the bimodal uh, then for the uniform and then for the normal distribution. Now, all of this is also going to be true if we buy at a higher price, right? If we're now buying at the dashed line, we're actually uh, doing something stupid. Uh, we would be buying this thing for more than it's worth. We'd have the same dynamics. In that case, we might think that's good because after all, we're buying at an objective loss. But the same thing, of course, is also true if I'm offered this thing at, a, at an advantageous price, right? Now I would be making a profit and it's still going to be the case that I'm going to have this larger outlay, this larger minimum additional outlay uh, for the bimodal distribution. So that's a first indication that the shape of the distribution simply beyond the mean and variance matters. And it's also the first indication that polarization is accompanied by more dysfunction in some sense. Now we're just thinking about what's required to get a majority on board, we can also think about minority-led action. And that's interesting in particular, I think, because many real-world political voting systems uh, require only a simple majority. Not everybody goes to vote, so that already translates into a minority of the population. But there are additionally also countries that have strong winner-take-all systems uh, that readily convert minorities into quite strong majorities like the UK and the US. Now, if we think about the minimum number of people that we need to feel strongly about an issue or think that some, some kind of critical value is reached, we can think again about this buying at the EV example and now just sort of start from uh, zero and look at how many people we have on board at each uh, particular proportion of the population. And then it's in the nature of this bimodal distribution that will have a higher proportion with an extreme subjective expected value, which means we also have a more motivated or readily mobilized minority, which in some sense will make it easier for the sort of tail basically to wag the dog. So, we're all familiar with the idea that belief polarization leads to the erosion of the middle, then means that it's harder to form a supermajority or any majority, in fact, but it's also in some ways easier to form a decisive minority. 
Um, so that's the voting itself, but we can also ask what happens when people have actually voted, right? At some point, this prospect is realized, for example, um, the purchase failed or it went through, uh, that's going to have implications for how people feel. So let's assume for a first instance that our attempt to purchase this prospect at expected value just failed. So the people who were pushing this are now going to be unhappy, right? They thought they were getting a bargain. It didn't happen. And if we look at what they think they lost in value subjectively, we can see again that this is going to be largest for the bimodal distribution, right? The sort of disappointed coalition is going to be most disappointed uh, on, on aggregate uh, under the bimodal distribution. But we can also look at the happiness of the population as a whole. We can also look at advantageous deals and just for some variety, we can look at selling as opposed to buying. So to kind of run you through what happens there, uh, I'm gonna start by assuming the base case where there's no uncertainty, right? Everybody knows what the true expected value is. In, in that case, right, we'd have our 10,000 uh, individuals here. They all know this is the true expected value. They all know that this dashed line price is uh, a bargain. And this is the difference in expected value that they're, uh, that they're, uh, that they're going to kind of harvest. Um, and this is, this, is, this is the gain that they would expect uh, on this prospect ultimately being realized. Now, let's assume, again, there's uncertainty, and I'm just going to assume for simplicity that there's the step functions, this completely split society. They basically think this prospect is worth zero, and everybody else thinks it's worth the sort of maximum value. Now, uh, what we're going to see is that regardless of what actually happens, reality is going to disappoint, right? Before the value of the prospect is realized, this is what the, the people who think this is a good thing is think they're going to get. And the red square is what the people who think it's a bad idea think they're going to lose. This is what you can see you actually got out of some future point in time where the value is realized. Um, but if we think about what they expected, then we see, of course, that there's a difference between what was actually obtained and what was expected as a result of this transaction. And if we factor that in, we have corresponding disappointment and relief, right? And we see actually that the disappointment uh, is bigger than the relief. And we can factor in this minimal additional outlay, right? You're gonna have to get some people on board. They were against, but they now feel neutral because they're being compensated. You're going to have to take that from somewhere. They thought they were getting something, but they're now neutral because you've taken something away. Uh, everybody's going to get what you get, but it's not going to change the fact that there's this net disappointment. And we can now look at these different belief distributions and look at the way those are going to interact with these basic dynamics. And we're going to see that once again, the bimodal is going to exacerbate these differences relative to the other distributions. And we can turn it around, right? And look at selling at a loss. Now people are gonna be uh, happy and relieved on average, again, perversely, right? Um, and the bimodal distribution is going to aggravate that relative to the other ones. So, uh, we see that uh, the bimodal makes it harder to act collectively overall. Um, and it also has the, the most adverse effect on the sort of subsequent sort of net population satisfaction with respect to whatever transaction actually happened. Uh, the final thing to very briefly consider is the uh, impact of uh, these different belief distributions on the ability to discriminate genuinely different prospects. So at the moment, there was one prospect with a true expected value and different perspectives on that. This is now a situation where we have two genuinely different prospects, uh, but with the same uh, distrib belief distributions attached to each of these options. So um, 
this has an expected value of 250. This is now 200. I've lined them up and scaled them such that these lines kind of go through. So the uh, true difference in value between these two prospects corresponds to the length of this arrow here that you have in the middle. But only the people in the middle of this distribution see that true value. If you go to the people who overestimate the value, uh, they exaggerate also the difference between these two prospects. And the people below uh, shrink these differences. So there's also a loss of discernment that's associated with the uncertainty around the expected value. And again, the affected population proportions are largest for the bimodal, larger than for the uniform, and larger for the normal. Finally, we can kind of ask about the sort of robustness of this uh, otherwise very stylized setup. So I can relax the assumption that the EV is slap bang in the middle of the distribution. I have some extra slides on that. I can also relax the assumption that everybody shares the exact uh, same belief about this value. So we can, for example, add in the fact that there's uh, random Gaussian noise around this subjective value, then our distributions look like this. Uh, they become asymmetric. You can see that there, but this is simply the effect of adding noise on that distribution of value. Uh, and we can see also that that doesn't in base in first instance change anything about the basic dynamics uh, of what I showed you. As I increase that noise further, um, these distributions will become more and more asymmetric because you can go off in one direction, but it's, it's much harder to go off in the other direction. Uh, and eventually there comes a point where it's simply dominated by the variance uh, in the different views on the value of the prospect. And finally, um, I can think about what happens with all of this with less uh, stylized and perfectly matched distributions. And my motivation for thinking about this is coming from the fact that uh, in the last half year, I've been spending a lot of time with a new agent-based uh, modeling framework that we have called Norman, which models information exchange uh, across networks for uh, otherwise Bayesian agents. And unlike most models of opinion dynamics or, or testimony and social epistemology, these agents exchange individual arguments, which profoundly affects uh, the belief dynamics of models like this. And in particular, it also profoundly affects the kind of circumstances under which you see polarization. And we've systematically been exploring these other circumstances that generate polarization. And you can, of course, take any belief distribution that you get in a model like this or on any real world issue and consider its implications for the kinds of things I outlined. So to summarize, um, there's a, unsurprisingly an uncertainty premium for decision making, right? If you don't know what the true expected value of a prospect is, that's going to cost you in some ways. But maybe the less obvious thing is that the distribution of that uncertainty matters. All of the uh, distributions I showed you had exactly the same uh, mean, uh, and they were centered around, in fact, for most of the things I showed you, around the true expected value. Uh, yet there are costs to the population as a whole, both when it comes to deciding, which becomes harder or easier in potentially problematic ways, uh, there are uh, weird effects with respect to regret when what happens actually happens. And there's a loss of discernment that goes with this in your ability to distinguish genuinely different uh, uh, prospects. And what I think is interesting in the context of uh, uh, your workshop is that I think these are genuine welfare costs because as this model of... Uh, uh, Norman, uh, this model of Bayesian agents exchanging arguments that I just mentioned would show you is that you can get these kinds of belief distributions in, individ in groups where all individuals are in fact perfectly calibrated. The only thing uh, that they differ in is that they've seen different bits of information. So their individual decision making might be as good as it could possibly be and in no way deficient. But there are then still potentially adverse effects that obtain as a result of these distributions at the collective level 
And across all of these, the bimodal distribution arguably fares worse uh, than the comparator distributions that I considered. And that's it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you for uh, this talk, very interesting. I think I'm immediately gonna uh, ask the audience, uh, is there any questions? If they're not, then I'm gonna ask a question. <laughs> <clears throat> so in, in um, um, you said that all of this, uh, so what about, the, again, the individual decision making? You said that all of them could be perfectly calibrated and do they also follow other are they perfectly Bayesian? Can it be perfectly Bayesian in your model, but uh, with Bayesian updating is still exhibit all of these behaviors? Or are they only that they can be perfectly calibrated? So, I mean, there's two separate parts. This was sort of a more, uh, uh, in, in, in the, the, everything I presented you in the talk, I'm just simulating these belief distributions outright, right? But what we have been examining in this model here is the circumstances under which perfectly, perfect Bayesian decision makers can end up with polarized de belief distributions, including ones that look as extreme or broad, almost as extreme as the bimodal distribution I, I showed you. And that, that is possible. Um, here's an example of a sample run of the model where they're quite polarized. It's not, it doesn't have the spread, right? But you can also get distributions where you have most people here and then you have the, the other half here. And it's simply, uh, and there are many factors that in a model like this can give rise to polarization. Um, we have a Pogsci paper coming uh, out in, in, in at the annual meeting of the Cognitive Science Society in, in July, for example, that shows that if you give agents a communication rule, which encourages them to share only their best evidence, you can end up with polarized societies. Or um, conversely, if you have agents that for some reason self-censor some of their information, they just try to sort of be slightly agreeable and not disagree with other people, you can also. So there's, there's many, uh, there, once you start exchanging arguments, there are many ways which you can end up with societies where agents are uh, polarized, even though they're um, Bayesian agents which uh, who on expectation in expectation will be perfectly calibrated and, and this uh, exchange of information uh, this also uh, based solely on Bayesian updating if you get information from other individuals uh, yes. how is so that they're, they're, they know they know what the information nobody is lying they know what the inform what the argument everybody's trustworthy they know uh, there's no double counting, like all of the things that make things weird in, in, in other models don't exist in this model. So they're literally doing the best they can. Um, and the, the, these, these discrepancies arise because you, different people basically see different evidence. They see different arguments, right? In, in a context where there's lots of arguments kind of for and against a proposition. So then come the uh, obvious uh, uh, one second the obvious uh, question of how can we then <laughs> how can we then nudge uh, perfectly rational agents into uh, better states of the world <laughs> well i mean i think there's so for these agents uh, this is about improving their uh, in, uh, improving their knowledge is in, is, is is based is, is encouraging the exchange of information right so so whatever exchange you know better communication rules and better network connectivity will lead these agents to be better um yeah we have one thank you uh, very interesting um I was wondering, I mean, you did the analysis assuming there is a single true value. Um, but in many situations, the truth is also a, a distribution of probabilities. So the, all the initial stuff assumed that there was a right. true value. And then all of these plots show you what happens when you relax that assumption. 
and allow different people to have, in this case, a normal distribution around that true value. And this is what happens when to these distributions as you make those more that more and more and more broad. Right. So, and, and your conclusion regarding uh, polarization, um, it still holds for in that case for for normal distribution of true values. Up to a point, yes. And some of the things get worse because this distribution. So, you know, some of the things start to change because this distribution now also becomes asymmetrical. Right. Right. Like you can you you because it's much easier to overshoot than it is to undershoot. You get this kind of start to get this massive tail. Right. Where the, the expected value here is still somewhere around 250 as it was before. But there's now a whole bunch of people who, you know, people who think it's like 800 or a uh, thousand two hundred, whereas the bottom is still, you know. Somewhere around. Zero or a little bit below zero. Right. So, so, and, and the question is also, how is the empirical evidence uh, in favor of a, a normal priors in terms of or normal distribution for true values? Um, because I, I presume in, in, for some, for some, um, probably for some um, processes or or things, you might eventually have a. a probably very little understanding. So you might have a uh, uniform distribution. So, so, so I, I think this is, to me, this is sort of conflating, conflating two things, right? Like people, ultimately people have the values they have, right? right? So, it, you know, your, your choice is as good as mine. That, that's not pathological. There is something weird, however, about you believing, at least at an aggregate level, about you believing strongly that something is true and me believing strongly that something is false, right? And this is why belief polarization is more interesting to me than the value polarization in and of itself. Like I could in principle rerun much of this story by just saying people are polarized about the value, but in, in a sense, Right. There's there's nothing. It, and, you know, and then it's, for example, the case that people it will cost more to make a decision in the society where people have polarized values. Think of the U.S. on issues to do with abortion. Right. But in a sense, because it's people's values that are um, polarized, they're also getting more or getting less. Right. Whereas I've chosen to illustrate the dysfunction, I've chosen specifically a situation where they all agree what the thing is worth and looked at the costs of belief polarization on top of that, right? Like there's, there's, no, there's no in principle reason to believe that combining belief polarization with value polarization additionally going on and particularly these potentially also being correlated in some way is now suddenly going to magically make this collective more uh, functional, right? But this is so. So, so in, in in a way, part of the demonstration is is less to sort of say uh, this is actually all the stuff that's going on in real uh, societies than to kind of illustrate what the kind of yeah what the what the kind of conceptual impact of like why would you even think that belief polarization was bad? Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Eureka. That was really, uh, yeah, I need to think a little bit about that. <laughs> thank you so much.